Up next, we have Jamie Haskell, who's a mount maker and craftsman from Haskell Consulting in Seattle, Washington. He's going to speak to us about mount making material selections for object safety. Hello, everyone. Uh, really wonderful to be here. Uh, get oriented. Um, when I uh, realized, uh, well, when I realized I was going to be coming uh, after Chris's talk, I, I mentioned it to my wife, who said, "Well, this is this is good. You better be a little light on your feet." Um, and it's you've given me a great basis. Thank you. Chris, for talking about materials. I'm going to take off my glasses because that's really, well, maybe not. Um, any case, first, I wanted to thank the organizers, thank Dante and Philip and the whole group, uh, Cleveland Museum of Art, for hosting this event. A big round of applause, please. <laughs> uh, I've been. Uh, a mount maker for about 25 years now for Seattle Art Museum and a lot of the different Seattle institutions and then was in Santa Fe for seven years as chief preparator down there. And I'm now in private practice, again working with uh, various institutions and private clients. Uh, currently doing work with the Alaska State Museum which is building a new museum opening in about a month and you all are going to want to see it. It is a fabulous project. Uh, as a result, I've been working in places where there isn't necessarily the level of, uh, of testing ability that Cleveland has or the Getty or the Smithsonian. And so I'm trying to talk a little bit coming from that point of view. Uh, the original idea for this talk came when I went to the AIC materials testing conference that was in Washington, D.C. this past November, and it was a lot of detail of what you've just seen and a lot of the reasons you do it and the failures, and uh, it was coming from the conservation end of things, so a lot of it went over my head, but there's huge amounts of information, and it was really fascinating. Um, but as my thoughts progressed on talking about materials testing, I was really thinking about how do we select materials as mount makers, as the practical end of things, and uh, wanted to really have that discussion uh, among ourselves because, I mean, as just we were sitting here waiting for this to start, I was talking with Shelley from the Smithsonian and Mac from the Getty, and we were just exchanging little tidbits that just made me go, oh my God, we've got so much in this room. So uh, already the talk has been of trying to do uh, additional sharing of how we find things. Um, and as such, this talk will probably give rise to more questions than answers, and I'm hoping that it will help us all think really deeply about how this little niche of mount making fits uh, into the greater world of collections and their preservation and presentation. So as mount makers, we're, we're in an interdisciplinary profession. We've got so many roles. We're professional problem solvers, designers, researchers, conservation techs, engineers, machinists, artists, art handlers, diplomats, <laughs> procurement specialists, and budget analysts, and that's a big part of it. Um, underlying all that, there's these two missions that we have in museum exhibits. We have to maintain the safety of collections, but we also have to get the doors open on time, and that's the one that we all know all too well and that leads to both good and bad work. Um, and so, you know, it was really trying to focus on how do we make sure that we maintain that, that first mission because both these missions have to be accomplished jointly. They can't be 
you can't do bad work. Um, so as we've seen in Chris's talk, uh, the materials testing is an essential tool in maintaining the safety and health. And this is a slide from the history of body testing at the materials testing conference. Um, there are a few things, and they'll all be, you'll notice they're kind of askew because of where I was sitting in the audience, the, taking pictures of people's uh, presentations. And as Chris talked about, with the, with the worldwide emphasis on testing, there's now these resources of the AIC Wiki uh, is the big one. And every time I go to it, not only to the materials testing section, but there are sections on mount making and on other disciplines within conservation. And every time I go to it, I learn more and more and more. And so I, I heartily encourage you to go to AIC's homepage and investigate the wiki and just explore. And then, uh, since there is sections on mount making, uh, and other disciplines, we all need to be contributing. And I haven't yet, and I think we, we'll all take the, uh, the impetus from this conference and continue doing more and more for our, our group. Another database that I found out about at the PAC-IN uh, summit that was held in New Orleans this past October uh, is the MITS database, and this is the Material Information Translation site. Uh, and this is part of ICEFAT, which is the International Consortium on Exhibit and Fine Art Transport. This is the, I believe it's 33 top art handling companies in the world. Um, this site is more focused on shipping and packing and crating and things like that, but it's, it's a pretty interesting site. Uh, it translates the entries into, Ger it's a Germany-based uh, effort, and it translates into German, French, Italian, Spanish, and Turkish, as well as English. Um, it's really just at the beginning of its, uh, its life. I, and I am not a customer per se, and I don't, I'm not sure if there's additional information from the customer point of view, but in talking with the people uh, who are starting it up, it, it sounds like it's going to be something that we're going to be wanting to see used. Um, all of these are kind of crowdsourced lists from institutions, organizations, individuals that are performing testing. And as Chris talked about in the incredible delicacy of doing the ID test and the other tests, there's variations. And so the results differ possibly from contamination, possibly from this and that. The nice thing is that as more and more testing is done, the pool of data grows and we're definitely getting trends that are, are happening. I, I look forward to seeing in another number of years how certain categories of things become much more apparent as safe and as not. Um, part of this too is that most of, you know, since we're working on things that are, we're sourcing out of the commercial realm Formulations change, um, machines are not calibrated correctly, so you get a batch that's different. So in you know, real sensitive situations, continuing testing is definitely a necessary thing. So you know, in looking at you know, highly sensitive materi or materials on display, those are the ones where we're going to have to be really, really focused on finding the, the things that are truly the best. Um, but these lists will be tools that are really going to be helping in this. With that said, I'd like to talk about some of the other factors that influence our materials choices. Um, 
So for most of us, when we're sourcing things, what are the everyday factors we're looking at in choosing our materials? I mean, the first thing, being mount makers, being structuralists, it's the structural suitability. Is it stiff enough? Is it strong enough? Uh, you know, the, one of the things I love about brass is that it has proven itself over time as being strong enough to do so much. It's not strong enough to support you know, hundreds of pounds, but it's st strong enough to do most of what we need to do in the, the common everyday hand size things that we work with. And it's incredibly forgiving and easy to work with. Stainless steel is stiffer, stronger, but the learning curve on the fabrication is more difficult. Thus, the second thing, is it workable? Do we have the tooling? Do we have the expertise to work with it? Is it affordable from both a time and money standpoint? Um, there are some things that are really expensive, but they work so well that it's worth the money. And there are some things that are cheap, but they take a long time to, to do the fabrication. Um, are they available? Uh, working in Alaska, that's been a really big, big deal because to get things up there, the shipping cost alone adds double the, the price. So uh, we try to keep a fairly narrow range of things and uh, figure out what we can use that's local that is still acceptable and appropriate and acceptable, I kind of went back and forth on that wording and I came to appropriate because there are some things that may or may not be worth workable in one situation where in another situation because of what you're mounting or where you're mounting it, they actually work quite well. Um, so in preparation for this talk, I did a little survey of the materials that I had in my shop and looking at uh, ethafoam, uh, I'm even using my pointer, uh, ethafoam blanks. Oh, no, that's the back. Ah, there it is. Don't press that button, he said. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, ethafoam hat blanks that I'm, I'm doing for a private collection of some beautiful Northwest Coast material. Um, metals and plastics, my my little stock of brass and steel and stainless there, and then my plastics, uh, Sintra. Uh, I've got got a great deal on the the sheet of red, and uh, so I, I actually use Sintra and some other things that I do. I've I've built banjo cases out of them, <laughs> out of it. Quite interesting material, heat formable and everything, and it passes. Uh, acrylic, obviously, uh, Vivac, uh, Jim Williams is going to be doing some uh, talking about some work he's been doing with Vivac, uh, and Gator Foam, uh, and so these were all things that I've used in the past, and so I'm using again. Um, these were paints uh, in the private collection work that I'm doing where things are out in the open, I'm not as worried about the reactions of paints for finishing, but the Liquitex acrylics, uh, regular uh, uh, artist acrylics have generally passed, and this is a spray formulation which I'd love to see tested, but trying to work with a an association of the normal has been good, and so for this use, I'm feeling that's that's good. Uh, the uh, come on, come back. Uh, Lasco Fix is a spray uh, B72, uh, Paraloid B72, and so I'll use that as a sealing coat uh, on certain things. And then on metal finishing, I really like using patinas, and these are Birchwood Casey commercial patinas uh, for brass and for steel, and another place where, in general, I feel uh, 
they've been very good, but I'd love to see further testing of does a metal that has been patinated since a patina reaction is a actual, I guess it's a, I don't want to call it a corrosion reaction, but it is a, a metal reaction. And after it is stopped with washing, does that uh, leave any residues that are um, of concern? Uh, as I said, this talk is probably going to raise more questions than it provides answers. Um, uh, ultra suede, uh, we've talked about suaded polyethylene, and this is commercial uh, ultra suede upholstery fabric, which I use uh, 3M465 adhesive uh, as a double stick. Uh, but again, I'm not using it in general in contact with metal objects, uh, and uh, so it's uh, it's funny. After after Chris's talk, I'm questioning all my choices now. It's like, is this right? Uh, and then here we have uh, felt from our friends at Benchmark, which has been ID tested and is also pre-cut. It's a more expensive product for me, but it saves so much time. It is so worthwhile. It's great stuff. Uh, adhesives, uh, it's great going to the AIC wiki and seeing Super 77 on there uh, as passing ID test. It's nasty stuff, but used properly has worked well. Uh, the uh, Scotch VHB tape, I ended up with just the tiniest little bit to be able to put in a picture, uh, but uh, in all its various formulations, that's just such a great product. And then again, B72 in multiple situations. Hot melt glue, that's again a certain thing where I know that some has been tested. I'm hoping the one that I'm using is, is appropriate, but again, I'm using it in an open, uh, open air uh, situation. Um, most of these materials have been tested and accepted as safe over many years of use in the museum community. Uh, it's the search for new materials that becomes a little bit uh, difficult as well. Um, and in the quest for new materials, you know, I want to encourage people to talk with their industrial suppliers. Uh, when I was at Seattle Art Museum, we had great luck working with Hilti and uh, 3M, and we are that odd use where talking with their factory reps, they get excited about it, and we've had great uh, luck talking with technical departments and uh, everything. But then the catalogs of McMaster Carr and R.S. Hughes and Cole Palmer and Fisher Scientific. Um, I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm talking to museums that are looking at me going, yeah, we use these all the time but I'm also talking to the rest of us that don't get to see these as much. Um, and then also working with allied industries of jewelry, jewelry manufacturing, bicycle frame building, uh, plastics fabrication, uh, medical and dental supplies, laboratory supplies. Um, this is a uh, low temperature formable plastic from Patterson Medical. I just used it to make a very different kind of mount, which was a shoulder rest for a violin for a friend, but it gets supple at 125 degrees, I believe, so you put it in warm water and it fuses to itself, and so it's safe from a physical point of view to be in more intimate contact with an object. Uh, this is something that I've continued to think about after Pam Gable's work at the Field Museum with orthoplast years ago, wonderful paper that she wrote that was some of the stuff that I learned from. And then occasionally you find, you come to uh, sourcing things out of as uh, common a place as your desk drawer. Um, this wonderful owl feather headdress in Alaska has a baleen strut that comes up and it's all very floppy. This is uh, held with magnets to a mainframe, but I needed something to tie that baleen to an upright strut. 
and that's a binder clip coated with poly suede. Uh, you can see the little wire. So, and that proved to be, you know, it's a nice metal clip, uh, even adjustable for the pressure. Uh, so a, a, a little quick case study, we've, you know, the search for a moldable compound suitable for object contact, uh, Pliocrave was for years the epoxy putty of choice. Uh, it went out of production. Philadelphia Resins discontinued it. Um, Ave Studio uh, has a group of products that have passed Adi testing well. Overall, they're good. They're not quite as nice uh, as the uh, Pliocray was. I'm still looking for a substitute, but they're generally considered safe, usually used with a barrier of Paralyte V72. Um, but I've wanted for a long time a resilient molding compound that I could use. And working with a conservator from the uh, Peabody Museum at Harvard, he was using uh, GERT 615 and molding it in a, uh, a glass uh, baking dish and then cutting it up and using it for mount padding. Um, it's now changed name, it's Momentive RTV 615. But I tried working with bulking agents with it, and this is a while ago, I haven't tried this again, but trying to get it so that it was a moldable compound where you could put it on something and have it stay. Uh, and I was never able to do it. So just recently, uh, this is my one typo, that should be moldable, <laughs> uh, but Sugru is a really interesting moldable silicone uh, putty and it has passed ID tests. It's uh, a Shore 70 durometer, so it's firm, but, but really quite strong. Highly adhesive, so you can put it on something. It looked really good, but I wanted to know more. I talked to, to BJ Farrar from the Getty and said, well, so what's your thought on, on doing surface testing? And he said, well, fresh terracotta is a great absorptive uh, substrate. And so I did tests where I, uh, and I did this right before the last mount making forum, so this is now two years on, but uh, did control, and then I washed, uh, I did where I washed cured uh, spots of it with water, ethanol, ethanol and water, soap and water, and you can see contamination areas. So there's a residual silicone oil that is on the surface of it that doesn't wash off easily, but is there. And sadly, it didn't pass that kind of testing. And so there's, we have to keep these other tests besides the chemical tests as part of it. And we may find other ways, but uh, at this point, Sugru is not on my active materials list was sad. So the final thing I wanted to talk about is the greater context of the exhibit and how that affects our work. Are there times when objects themselves are a danger uh, to other objects on display? Are there times when the object material makes the use of otherwise unacceptable materials okay? And again, these are questions. These are not necessarily answers. Are there things that can be done to mitigate adverse conditions? And Chris's talk about the scavenging foam, and that was wonderful to see because I haven't seen that specific piece of equipment. Um, and are there times when inevitable degradation in an object is actually acceptable? So at the Alaska State Museum, we've been working with materials that, in this case, is objects from a shipwreck. Um, the shipwreck of the Islander uh, went down and these were recovered from there. So we've got, uh, this is a silk, a roll of silk wall covering. Uh, it was, you know, uh, Victorian era, beautiful brocaded silk. I pulled it out of its plastic bag. It has been washed. It has been, it's had really excellent conservation work. It is actively degrading and it is off-gassing acetic acid at a surprising, at a, you know, a very noticeable smell. 
Um, the that I keep thinking that's it. Um, the wool tail coat wool inevitably gives off a certain amount of sulfur. There are rubber shoes, uh, and they could go one way or the other. There's bronze. There's an incredibly corroded hammer. It you know the seawater uh, corroded it. But these are the story that needs to be told. So how do we reconcile that? And the casework was perfectly designed with a lot of air exchange so that there was a much lower possibility of maintaining a chemical soup in there. That's, that's the, the hope on that, but it's a hope. It's, so it needs confirmation. Uh, notations were made during the installation process that this is a, a high danger case, needs continual monitoring and pos possible additional measures of something like the scavengers, scavenging uh, film or uh, activated charcoal. At this point, this is where the get the doors on open on time is the necessity. This museum opens a month from the 6th. <laughs> so it's coming right up. Um, this is an example of continued monitoring. This is at the, uh, the National Gallery, uh, and I went and saw this during the materials testing workshop. There is basically an on-site ADI test going on in the case. These are waxes of Degas bronzes, um, and they have a wax, they have plaster, they have wood, so the object itself has a whole lot of stuff going on. And so again, the, the continuing material testing is, uh, or monitoring is what's important there. Um, this is a case at Alaska. There are wood products in some of these backboards that might or might not be acceptable in many situations, but the bone and ivory materials are generally considered very safe. Now, since uh, I made this slide, I've had conversations that make me wonder how those may do in view of uh, other information. So again, more questions, it's, but continuing to do the work. Um, and in this case, there is a set of bunny boots, and bunny boots were a rubber boot that was a two layers of rubber sandwiching a, a layer of felt in between that they were ultra low temperature boots that were used in the Arctic and in Korea. Um, those are actively degrading. They're gummy. They're quite nasty. Uh, but they tell the story. So underneath it is a full plexiglass mount that is there both to support it but also to be a barrier in between it and anything down below. And again, this is a place where uh, continued monitoring will be the norm. So in conclusion, I just, I kind of hope this, this little meditation on materials has been interesting. Whether we're using familiar supplies to build a simple mount or trying to satisfy a specific set of criteria through a source in the industrial world, we need to select our materials with conscious and creative thought. This quest for the perfect stuff is one of the odd problems that's presented itself in this funny little job that we've got. Um, I hope we continue to expand this list of great choices to meet the challenge of safely displaying these objects. And I hope we can all come together to discuss this and continue to make this happen. Thanks so much.